My grandparents were from Caroline County, Virginia. But in the early 20th century, they, along with lots of other black people, went north and ended up in Philadelphia. And that's where my mother was raised. My grandfather ended up living in the projects in South Philadelphia. And when he was 86 years old, some young kids broke in and tried to steal his TV. And he said no. And he was stabbed to death. He was uh, a murder victim. I was 16 years old. I saw the pain and anguish that created in our family. The question we asked was why? Why did this happen? Why would these young kids act like that? When I go into poor communities and I sit down with young boys and I try to have an honest conversation with them, they'll say, Mrs. Stevenson, I know I'm going to be in prison by the time I'm 21. Because they're living in communities where 80% of the young men of color end up in jail or prison. And so they say to me, Mr. Stevenson, I've got to go out here and get mine while I can. But a bigger question is, why was my grandfather in South Philadelphia living in the projects in his mid-80s? And that has a lot to do with this history. It has a lot to do with the era of lynching. It's why six million black people fled the American South in the first half of the 20th century. One of the largest mass migrations in world history. The black people in Cleveland, the black people in Chicago, the black people in Detroit, in Los Angeles, in Philadelphia, in Boston, in New York, came to these communities as refugees and exiles from terror in the American South. Those communities have never been given the opportunity to recover in the way that I think they should. And that creates conditions today that are very problematic. What's happening to too many of our children in these communities where people fled from violence and terror is that they're still being terrorized. Yeah, no guns this time. They live in violent neighborhoods. They go to violent schools. And by the time they're five, they actually have a trauma disorder. Threat and menace becomes a defining reality in the lives of these children. And when you're constantly dealing with that year after year after year, at the age of eight, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I got a drug, why don't you try this? And for the first time in your life, you have three hours where you don't feel threatened and menaced. What do you want? You want more of that drug. And if somebody at 10 or 11 says, hey, man, why don't you join our gang? We're going to help you fight all of these forces that are threatening and menacing you. And you say, yeah. Instead of seeing that choice as a choice that that's a bad kid, we ought to see that choice as a choice of a larger problem. We've got 13 states in this country with no minimum age for trying a child as an adult. I've represented nine and 10 year old kids facing 60 and 70 year prison sentences. We started putting 13 year old children in prison with sentences of life imprisonment without parole. We condemned them to die at 13 and 14. I came to this work through the death penalty and so I think I felt that I emotionally was prepared for anything. One of the first cases I worked on with a young teenager, I went and drove to a county jail after hearing from a relative that they had a nephew who'd been arrested, charged with a felony, was being held in the adult prison. I got there, and there was this 14-year-old African-American kid in the hallway, chained to a pole in an enormous orange jumpsuit that was so big for him, it was completely covering his hands. And I remember just the sight of all of these people coming and going around him just completely unaffected by that. It's the first time I remember being in a prison and really having to dig my nails into myself to prevent myself from crying. <laughs> 
In 2005, a case called Roper v. Simmons, the Supreme Court struck down the death penalty for children. Alabama had one of the largest juvenile populations on death row, that when that decision came down, we started talking with them about the fact that they weren't going to be executed. I think some of us expected joy and relief, but what we got instead was, I'm just getting a different kind of death sentence. I'm going to die in prison through incarceration rather than execution. It made us start to think more critically about the propriety of a death in prison sentence for any child. We impose life without parole on people we think will never change or beyond redemption and hope. All children change, they grow. And to condemn them any point during that process seems unfair. The Supreme Court heard arguments today about the propriety of imposing life sentences on some of the country's youngest criminals for crimes that do not involve murder. Do they belong behind bars forever? Or should they have a chance someday at freedom? The cases before the court today were both from Florida, a defendant who was 13 when he raped a 72-year-old woman, and a 16-year-old who committed armed burglary and assault. We're very hopeful that uh, we can uh, create the kind of jurisprudence that sentences children rationally and appropriately. And we concede that some kids were going to have to be punished and have to be sent to prison, but we don't believe that any child, particularly a child of 13, should ever be condemned to die in prison. And we'll wait to see what the court says. What about the argument that you don't know what the child's going to become? Well, I think that's right. We, we don't know, but we do know that when we intervene with children, our chance of success is so much greater than when we, when we intervene with adults, which is why we shouldn't condemn children in the way that we condemn adults. Uh, my brother colleague is here, and I'll, I'll turn things over to him at this point.